Hello, hello, good morning, happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Yeah, good to hear your voice, Dave. How's Nellie treating you? Nellie's doing great. Excellent. I'm glad to see her. We'll have a few more coming in too. Why don't we take just a, a, a short few minutes to have some prayer? I'm going to have to end the class at 10:30 today. Um, I have to go to a funeral, so uh, we won't have much time. Short prayer session, though. Who's preaching, Pastor? It's Matt. He's going. He's doing. It. He's going to be talking about. He does a really good job this morning. We'll put our building project up there. I think Sister Wanda likes us to mention Monty, and we want to uh, definitely put Celeste. How's the job situation coming? She's had an interview this past week. I don't know. Okay. Well, this well, we'll lift it up. Manelli? Captain yeah. for healing, please. For healing? Yes. Captain. What's that? Country. Captain. Okay. Captain. Kathy for healing. Oh, yeah. Amen. And Mark. Oh, we definitely want Mark Rush. He's taking some antibiotics right now. We pray for healing for him. Yeah. Drive through prayer. Drive through prayer. Yes. Good, good evening yesterday. Hey, Amen, Ryan. bro. There's a church up on like, toward Gray there. That has a has a little sign drive through prayer. Are you really? It really is. Okay. You catch it on? Is it catch it on? Look at that. Yeah, the lady coming yesterday. What's her name? Anna. Anna and her daughter uh, is staying with her, and she's a member of the church. She's ninety-two years old. Anna. And. Uh, and the job we're talking yes, about. Yes, yeah. 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 Yeah, she's tougher than a snuffer. Uh, <laughs> it's her daughter that wants to Krista. Krista. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, Has to put our country up there too. Okay. Our country. Thank you. Yeah. yeah uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, could we add uh, my friend Donnie to the prayer list? Donnie Godsey. Okay, Donnie. Uh, what's the last name, Susie? Godsey. Are you saying Godsey? G O D S E Y. G O D S E Y. Okay, got it. Is it for healing or? Yes, please. Okay. Excellent. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. Oh, peace of mind. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and feel free. We got some more chairs over there. You want to bring some more chairs in to fill the corner? Okay. Sheila and Sandra. Sheila and Sandra. Okay. This piece of paper. I can do this to your son. You pass it back to your brother. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tony wanted me to mention uh, religious liberty if you want to mention that today. Do you mind taking a picture of this? Why don't we have a short prayer? Go ahead, Wanda. Praises for the sunshine. Oh, yes. I love sunshine, especially in the wintertime. Yes. Amen. And I have a praise and a request. Uh, pray for Shasta, my wife, and baby. Amen. 
and then uh, prays for our um, Bible studies uh, during the week. Well, I'm going to put this over here too, right? Yes. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do praise you and thank you for the sunshine, for drive through prayer, for the Bible studies in Johnson City, and for the people attending there. We do pray for the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts, and we want to lift up in a special way our building project, Monty, Celeste for a job, Kathy for healing, Mark Rush for healing, and continue to pray for drive through prayer to use it to touch people in the community, for the Ramsey family with their loss, for our country, for Donnie Dopsy and healing and peace of mind, for Sheila and Sander for healing, and for Shasta and the baby. And just pray, God, that you touch our hearts today as we open the word of God. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. So we've been in Daniel chapter one, and we see in Daniel chapter one, there's really a, a hint of a health message there. So uh, we've been talking about some of the things that we're not supposed to eat, things that the devil has promoted and encouraged in our society that destroys us. Well, that's his purpose. He wants to destroy us, right? So, uh, just a kind of a quick, quick summary. We have, you know, here's the things that we don't. Don't put in our mouth, right? Anything from a pig, <laughs> all right? Um, and we could say anything in the water that uh, doesn't have fish or fins. No, or fins. Doesn't have scales or fins. Scales or fins. Right? Well, we Anything that doesn't have a cloven hoof and chews its cut. Doesn't have cloven hoof. Okay. Don't drink wine or any. Alcoholic beverage. Caffeine. You think caffeine should be on there? Should not. No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> she says. Yes. You do have differences of opinion about caffeine. <laughs> the key is stimulants, right? Uh, we're talking about things. And caffeine impacts different people different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, some people use that to help them with their ADHD, and some people it causes them to crawl up the walls and gives them the jitters, you know. So I, I, I think that's one. It's just like uh, eating sugar, right? I mean, sugar, if you eat too much of it, it's, gonna, it's bad for you, right? Right. If you eat a little every now and then, like a little every week, Illegal drugs. Illegal drugs. Illegal drugs. And so, essentially, we see from Daniel chapter one the best diet is plant based. Right? So in Daniel chapter 1, uh, we're going to pick it up here in verse 11. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And so what is the uh, diet that God gave Adam and Eve? Receive your to you, I give it for food, amen. Or for meat, they have said, but they meant food. let's go to Genesis chapter one and read that. We can see it from the word of God. Uh, so in Genesis chapter one, God makes mankind in his image, Adam and Eve, 
And he tells them in verse 29 what the original diet was. So what do we have there in Genesis 129? Who has that? And God said, See, I give you every herb that yields seeds, uh, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So God did not intend to have any animals dying on this earth, did he? I mean, that's what the original intent was. As a matter of fact, even after sin entered the human race, what did God say uh, Adam and Eve should eat? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, it starts in verse 17. He says, then, then to Adam, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, any comments on that? <laughs> no comment. Okay. Right. <laughs> and I've eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So where does he his food come from? From where? From the ground. What is the biblical definition of food? See <clears throat> there fruit. Okay, there's a verse in the Bible that we've covered recently. This is the test. If you want to go to heaven, you can pass the test. <laughs> Psalms 104, verse 14. That's it. Thank you, Gina. Psalms 104, verse 14 is the biblical definition of food. What does it say there? It comes from the earth, not animals. Food comes from the ground. That's what the Bible says. Everything else is filler. Real food, the type that we need to nourish our body, to strengthen us, to help us grow, comes from the ground. That's what the Bible teaches us in Psalms 104, verse 14. And so, as we go forward in Genesis chapter 3, he says, But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, that's the ground, and you shall eat the herb of the field. So notice he confirms there in Genesis 3 that food comes from the ground. So even when God first made this world a perfect place, and then even after sin entered the human race, uh, God was still advocating that we have a plant-based diet. So Daniel, here he is. He's, you know, Daniel is, how many years after Adam and Eve is Daniel? What do you think? I got a chart over here if y'all want to look at it sometime. Yeah, when you say well over 3,000 years, right? between Adam and Eve and Daniel's time. So here Daniel, he knows the story of Adam and Eve there in Genesis chapter one. He has the writings of Moses that was taken with him when he was taken captive to go to Babylon. And in that situation, uh, if you're a slave, do you think they're gonna put you on a camel and let you ride 800 miles on the camel and, you know, you know right? What are you gonna do? You're gonna walk. So he's just made an 800 mile trip. How long is it going to take his mouth to go 800 miles by feet? <laughs> it's going to take a while, isn't it? Yeah. Right? And do you think he's sleeping in a nice plush tent with a, you know, what What do you think? A blanket on the ground. A blanket on the ground. That's, even if he's got that, right? Probably just his clothes on the ground. Right? And so, you know, anybody got a stone I could use for a pillow? I mean, that's the type of situation he had for months. So he's made this 800-mile trip from Jerusalem to Babylon, and he learns that he's going to go to the University of Babylon, right, and be taught the ways of the Babylonians, and the king's going to share food from his own table with these people because he wanted to take people that he conquers, take the best of the best, teach them Babylonian ways, and set them back over their own people to rule underneath Babylonian, uh, in, in within the Babylonian system. That was his plan. i got a question about yes. time people travel. Did it take two years for the wise men to travel to see Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think it took two years, but, you know, when they saw the star, then they had to get everything ready. And I don't know how much time it took for them to get things ready. We don't really know how much time it took for them to travel, but they mainly traveled during the night because they were following the star, right? 
How old was Jesus when he went to Egypt? Well, uh, it says that whenever the wise men in Matthew chapter 2 uh, called up with Jesus in Bethlehem, that he was living in a house and that he was a child. So he might have been two years old at the time. So maybe the the time period between when the star appeared, whenever he was born, and the time they actually interacted with him, he might have been two years old. I would guess that. But to know how long it took them to travel that, I don't know. Because I think they had to get ready, right? Uh, you know, they, they brought the most costly type of uh, yes. presents yeah, yeah. that you could bring. So I'm assuming they had to sell things. They had to go out and purchase these things. They had to purchase supplies. They had to, to make sure that they had the proper uh, equipment, carts, camels, uh, servants, whatever, to, to be able to make a trip like that and to be able to go back. So I don't know how long it took. Let's say it took them, a, you know, maybe a year to prepare. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm just guessing. Okay, so... Uh, here we have Daniel and his three friends, and we have their uh, their uh, Jewish names here, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the Babylonian names. And uh, they say, test your servants for 10 days in verse 12 of Daniel chapter 1, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So they convinced the person that was over them to have this test for 10 days. And I can imagine, you know, the Babylonians saying, well, you got to have your protein, right? What, you know, they don't, wouldn't say it that way, right? If you don't eat your meat, you're going to look sickly. And then they're going to have my head because of it. But today, people say to us, if you're a vegetarian, oh, you got you got to have your protein, right? Mm -hmm. Well, where does the cow get its protein? That's what I say. <laughs> yeah, right? All you're doing is bypassing the cow and you're eating the grain. <laughs> right. Why well, go through the cow to eat the grain? It's very inefficient to do it that way. You know, an acre of land can feed a lot more people than to feed a cow than the cow feed people. It's a very inefficient way to do that. And so uh, here they're, they've convinced them now for 10 days to do this, verse 14, so he consented with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and healthier in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. So... This plant-based diet, this is what they had to do. 800 mile trip on foot, you know, living out in the elements. They looked pretty ragged by the time they got there. Uh, and the king wanted them to be pepped up. So he gives them the, his own food, thinking that's the healthiest type of food. Nope, it's not. They want vegetables and water. So what did Daniel do to pick the best possible diet to be the healthiest in the shortest period of time? He picked a plant-based diet. You see that? To get the healthiest in the shortest period of time, he picked a plant-based diet. And what's amazing to me is Daniel didn't know anything about cholesterol and fat and disease. You know, I mean, he didn't have the science behind it. He just knew what God said. What's amazing to me is God is millennia ahead of the science because he's the one who invented the science, right? Now we know that if we eat, uh, you know, the meat, it can clog our arteries, you know, from... Uh, the cholesterol that we get. You only digest cholesterol from animal products. That's it. You don't digest cholesterol from any plant products. Right. right? And so if you want to give your arteries a rest, you know, a plant-based diet is the way to go. You can reduce the buildup in your arteries, can't you? Wanda? As to the Jews were given a special way to uh, kill their animals, get rid of the blood and to cut the fat out. So probably these people cook their meat with the blood and the fat there. So they were aware of that. And we did acknowledge that the Bible says it's okay to eat the meat from a cow, right? Because it has clothing to they choose the cut. But the Bible also says don't eat the blood and don't eat the fat. Don't eat the guts and don't yeah. Yeah. Don't the chitlins, right? And so what the Bible recommends that if you're going to eat the meat, boil it in water first and get the fat and the blood out. Then you can eat it. It's like eating leather. Yeah. And, and if you do that, it's going to be totally different than if you just go to, uh, you know, a popular restaurant and order a hamburger because uh, that's got blood and fat in it. Right. 
And some people eat it when, you know, I want my steak cooked rare. I said, oh, you cut it and blood's up squirting now. I mean, that's, you know, the Bible says don't eat it that way. It's why? Because there's diseases in the blood, right? And the heat didn't always kill it. I mean, you got to autoclave things in the hospital, right? You have to get the temperatures, you know, what do they go to in the autoclave? About 1,000 degrees or something like that? No, 121 degrees centigrade for 15 minutes will sterilize most things. Which so, is, uh, 212 degrees Kelvin. I don't know what it is Fahrenheit, but everything's measured in centigrade usually uh, in sterilization te technologies. And they have they have found that uh, you know you used to hear a lot of that mad cow disease. You know, I, I, I take trips to Europe, and uh, these people would pick me up at the airport, and they, you know we'd get to talk, and they said, "Well, don't eat the meat, right?" Because they had these in Europe. This uh, these they get their cows. From England, and they had this big uh, mad, cow disease. mad cow disease, right? They had this, and so when I was looking at mad cow disease, just kind of learned a little bit about it. I learned about the prions, right? Mm -hmm. Now the prions are the ones that really they eat holes in the brain, your brain, mm -hmm. and uh, and the prions don't, they, they they don't die at 120 <laughs> degrees Celsius. Yeah, you it's get, an abnormal protein. It has to go a lot higher, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in hospitals, you know. It's called CJD, crucible diocrine disease, and, yeah. it, and it's very serious because it can take 15 to 20 years for you to really start showing like signs and symptoms of this just horrible disease. So hospitals are actually around the world are starting to put policies in where you use disposable um, because even uh, even if you put it in an autoclave, they're still doing some some studies that it's hard to kill that kind of mm -hmm. um, microbe. That protein, it's not a microbe, it's a protein. It's, it's a protein. normal protein. Okay. So it has a configuration uh, on the structure of the protein that allows it to survive uh, it normal sterilization techniques. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a very resilient, abnormal protein that we don't want to have any part of, right? It's like trichinosis is hard to kill too, even by cooking that you find in the pork and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, the the worm larva, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard Pastor that uh, the reason they have mad cow these like in <laughs> Europe and everything is their cow live really long time. They keep them for a long time. Whereas here we kill the um, so ours could have the beginning of mad cow, but that's they good point. off. That's a good point. And partly it was, you know, they were grinding up the dead diseased cows and feeding them back to the, to the healthy cows. I mean, that was part of the propagating this or posting that. So we see, when you look at the science, there's a lot of good reason why a plant-based diet is the best way to go, right? So that's what they chose. And notice we start in verse 14, he could sit with them in this matter tested in the 10 days, and verse 15 says they were a lot healthier than everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And as for these four men, this is pretty cool, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So what, I, what I've learned about this, because when I first started studying the Bible, I was a, a, a really a devout meat eater. <laughs> I didn't like vegetables, you know. I'd rather just eat meat. <clears throat> and so when I learned about this, you know, it was a hard thing to do to change your diet, right? I drank alcohol, I ate meat, and both those things are talked about in a negative way here. So I had to make changes in my life. And it's not always an easy thing to do, is it, right? Well, sometimes it maybe takes uh, over a period of time that you make these type of changes. But God can change your taste buds. No. Right? He can even get you to like broccoli. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle, right? As he succeeded with you. We love it. broccoli. Oh, do you love broccoli, Steve? I love broccoli. My favorite vegetable. Well, it's very healthy. It's a superfood, really. Yeah. It's a great thing to have, right? And so you, you guys uh, are fortunate that you like the taste of it. <laughs> now, Brussels sprouts, that's a different story. Amen. Oh, I, I struggle with that too, but you know, <laughs> some people, some people can tolerate them. Uh, many, many cabbages, right? <laughs> uh, so trees and cabbages—that's that's what they are, in my opinion. 
But I think it's interesting how what I learned when I when I gave up eating meat and started eating more of a plant based diet is that uh, you uh, you think clear. You can discern spiritual things better, and that's what I experienced in my own life. Right? That you can do this. Anybody else experience that too? Yeah, I see a few heads shaking your heads. Yeah. And so I think we see the evidence of a plant-based diet when it says God gave them knowledge and skill and wisdom. And I believe there, when you cooperate with God and follow the health laws that he has set in place, we're blessed by him with the ability to think better, uh, to have this skill and wisdom, really that comes from God, but we're able to receive it from him, aren't we? Jeremy? I've been kind of watching this health series, um, and it's given by an Adventist, and uh, it's, it's really phenomenal because the points that she makes, she says that God created our bodies, and it's a body that can heal itself when you give it the right conditions. And so by, by uh, partaking in a plant-based diet and eating the things that God had intended when he created us, um, it, we're given the right conditions for the body, the body to heal itself with so many different, I mean, vast, I mean, the world is just filled with thousands of diseases now. And um, so, and also, so when you, when you eat right and eat what you're supposed to, and you give your body these conditions, it gives you, you know, the Holy Spirit, when he talked to us and give, you know, we may be convicted to go out and, you know, share messages with others in the community, but it's hard to do that when you don't feel that. Right, right. And you're sick, you know, right. you know, and just not feeling, you don't have the energy. And so I think that's another reason why, you know, just to give us that extra, you know, that energy to do what God calls us to do. Right, amen. And, and so I, you know, it's really, God, with God the designer, you know, of our bodies, you know, we should give it the conditions that he wants for us. And, and by right. eating, you know, the right things, um, you know, I think that's, that's, we're capable of doing that. Exactly. And you mentioned the film, You what was the name of it you're watching? Um, it's by, um, yeah, it's on the Amazing Discoveries site. Okay. It's one, there's a long chain of different health speakers. But she's okay. One. Anybody she, seen the Game Changers? Oh, yes. Yeah, that was yes. awesome. Yeah, I've yeah. never seen that, yeah. Yeah, I was really surprised by the Game Changers. Uh, it's about a, a fighter who gets hurt. He's trying to figure out how to how to get back into good shape again, the, the fastest, easiest way possible. And he goes out and he interviews these people who are uh, the top of their sports, you know, and these different cycling and weightlifting, you know, and he, and he finds out a common denominator in these people is they have a plant-based diet. And then they get into the science of it. And it's really, really good. I think it's, is it on Netflix? Yes. Yeah, I think He's from England, the, the, the fighter. He, he was a UFC fighter. He's, uh, he had a double knee injury. And he's trying to figure out how he can get back into, you know, what he loves doing. And, and then he got kind of sidetracked with this. And that kind of became his, his main focus on how to share with other people how to be, become healthy. Right. It's a great incident. I've seen it. It's really good. Yeah, I, I think it's good too. Uh, just a little caution, maybe a little parental guidance there if you show it to your children, a few cuss words in it. But uh, other than that, it's a very good uh, information and it's science based. I love that about it too. You see how the Bible is way ahead of its time. You know, that's what I love about it. The Bible's way ahead of its time. And so we see the benefit here. It's not only from a physical standpoint, but a mental standpoint. Uh, the way we think, it impacts the way we think. We see that in verse 17. And uh, so you may have people say, well, what about Romans chapter 14? Right? You, we covered 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 already. But if anybody wants to ask that question again, feel free. But Romans chapter 14, uh, some people bring that up and say, and we'll read the first part of it there. Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, and he who is weak eats only vegetables. And so it almost sounds like uh, Paul is advocating eating whatever you want to eat there. And he's not talking about that at all. 
Notice in verse 17, the key there is the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he's not addressing the health laws. He's addressing salvation by grace through faith in Christ. You're not supposed to uh, put your faith in yourself. You know, if I do this, if I do this, if I do this, I gain merit in God's sight. I'm accepted by God. I can be saved. That, that's a falsehood. And that's what he's addressing here. He's not addressing the healthful living or the Sabbath there in Romans chapter 14. Notice that some people had certain feast days and certain religious ceremonies that they thought helped them have gained acceptance in God's sight. And he's saying, no, that's not what gains you acceptance in God's sight. It is having this relationship to, with God through Jesus Christ. The only way we can be accepted by God is through Christ. That's the only way. Why? Because he's the only human being that ever lived a perfect, sinless life. That's the only way to be accepted by God, right? He so was that, talking to Jews there, too, so he, that, he wasn't saying eat anything, any unclean foods. He was talking. Exactly. And if you go <clears throat> over here to Leviticus chapter 23, it's a great place to go when you're discussing this chapter because here in Leviticus... We have God talking about the annual, the annual Sabbaths. These are uh, ceremonial type of uh, feast and religious services that the Jews had in Leviticus chapter 23. If you notice, he starts in verse 3 and says, Six days uh, shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. So he's advocating you need to go to church on Sabbath. See, that convocation means you, you have corporate worship. You're coming together and worshiping God corporately. Then he goes on and he talks about, starting in verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. Okay? So now he's talking about what's under the ceremonial law. And he goes through and he does these different feasts. You can see he talks about the Passover there and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and the First Fruits of Harvest. So I, I did... Uh, uh, verse 5 is the Passover. Verse 6 is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, verse uh, 10 is the first fruits of your harvest. Uh, verse 15 is, uh, you can see they have the wave sheaf offering. offering. Uh, then you get into Pentecost. Um, so you have these different, uh, these seven feasts that are talking about here. And uh, verse 25, we have, uh, this is uh, the blowing of the trumpets and preparation for uh, the Day of Atonement in verse 27. So these are the ceremonial laws that God gave the Jews so they could understand the plan of salvation and look forward to the coming Messiah. Okay? But notice what he says. This is pretty cool. Now I'm talking about the Sabbath. Verse 37. These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. So these feasts were part of the ceremonial law and uh, which was fulfilled by Christ. To offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice of drink offerings, everything on its day. So who was the ultimate offering? Jesus. Jesus. He has fulfilled all these offerings. All these offerings pointing forward to some aspect of Christ's ministry. Uh, not only on earth, but as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So we study the feast to understand more about Jesus' role as our Messiah, as our Savior. But he has fulfilled these, so we don't have to keep the feast anymore. But notice what he says in verse 38. Notice how he differentiates the feasts, the annual Sabbaths, from the weekly Sabbath. Verse 38 says, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides the weekly Sabbath. So you have annual Sabbaths and you have weekly Sabbaths. And what he's addressing in Romans chapter 14 is the feast associated with the annual Sabbaths and how they ate, how, how they, the different days they observed. That was part of the ceremonial law. He's not addressing the health law or the moral law, the, the, the Sabbath commandment and the Ten Commandments in Romans chapter 14. How do we know that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19. What does he say about the importance of keeping the Ten Commandments. Who's got that? First Corinthians. 
chapter 7, verse 19. One know you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have God, and you are not your own. What, tech, what is that? 719? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 719. Mm -hmm. What, what what verse did you read, Manelli? The first Corinthians uh, seven nineteen. Uh huh. Yeah, but it's the King James. It should say circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's what the New King James says. Ah, okay, I I that. Sorry, I read six nineteen. I'm sorry. That chapter jumped in your way, didn't it? <laughs> well, maybe we needed to hear that verse too. Amen? <laughs> uh, the Holy Spirit's the one in charge. So <clears throat> we see he's not addressing uh, the weekly Sabbath in Romans 14, and he's not addressing the health laws from the Old Testament. He's addressing salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, and that you're not able to obtain merit in God's sight by observing these special days and special feasts. Okay. All right. It, any other questions that may come up when you're discussing diet with people or uh, anything in that realm or area that you want to bring up? Everybody's okay with 1 Timothy 4 4? If somebody brings that up, you know how to respond, right? What do you think? What's the saying in First Timothy four four? Who's for, got that? For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. All you got to do is pray over your food, and you can eat anything, right? Right? <clears throat> Isn't that what it says? I can go out and drink me a good tall drink glass of uh, arsenic or cyanide. As long as I pray over it, it's going to be okay. Right? Well, that's not true, is it? How do we, how do we address 1 Timothy 4.4? In the context, is in verse 3 of where he's talking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> verse 5 says it's sanctified by the Lord of God. And prayer. Amen. So, what was what, what the context, Jeremy? It says, forbidding to marry and command to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So, what is the context of 1 Timothy 4 for? What, what's he addressing? What foods? Four, one, uh, foods that God created? Yeah. Food that God created to be received. He's not addressing all animals. He's not addressing everything that's out there in the world, right? He's addressing what God has already approved that we can eat. That's what he's addressing. So I think you have to go to the context of verse 3 to be able to address 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. So, let me ask you something. About that. Yes. You go back to verse one. It says, "Given he to seduce some spirits and doctrines of the devil through speaking, and also forbidden." So, what does that mean? Who's who's doing that? The, the devils. Yeah, and he's talking about latter times there, isn't he? He's talking about our time. Some will depart from the faith. What are some, what, what are uh, doctrines of demons that are being taught today that people have accepted as truth from the Bible? Life after death. Yeah. Immortality of the soul is a doctrine of demons, right? What's another one? The Sunday sacredness, a doctrine of demons, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, people tend to do all Salvation by works. Yeah. yeah. Doctrine of demons. Yeah. Good point. Spiritualism. Spiritualism that comes from immortality of the soul. Doctrine of demons. 
I mean, these are things that the devil has injected in the popular churches and that people have received all their life, and they believe it's true because they've heard it in church all their life. But when you take them to the Bible and see that it doesn't line up with the Bible, they typically accept what they've always believed. You know, that's the sad part. That's what I was speaking of there. That's pride. These yeah. seducing spirits and doctrines of devils says they are forbidden to marry the commandment to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. Yeah, so that reminds me of the some of the teachings of the Catholic Church. Charlene, go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, where they forbid um, priests to, and nuns and brothers to marry. And right. also where, I don't know, it depends upon the month or the year, or I don't even know anymore, whether or not you can eat meat on Friday. Or fish, or, right. yeah. Right, yeah. Fish is not meat, but chicken is, you know. Yeah. That, that's the type of thing I think is being addressed here. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, when you when you study, of course, uh, we're going to get into this in heavier detail in the prophecies of Dan, the book of Daniel. But when you look at the little horn power of Daniel chapter seven and chapter eight, and the first beast in Revelation chapter thirteen, and see that they have the same characteristics, we're talking about the same entity, and uh, this same entity is here, alive and well in our world today, and promoting these type of things. Another thing that's being promoted is the Antichrist is in the future. It's called futurism. Uh, it's all wrapped up with this idea of the secret rapture, something that happens in the future. And so uh, these are doctrines of demons that are being taught to deceive people, right? And we'll get into that in more detail about some of these doctrines of demons to show that they're not from the Bible, but, even though they're common teachings today in churches. Beast and, and verse four, every creature of God, beast of Preachers that God says that you can eat. Right, exactly. Good point. Those are the ones that you can that you can pray over. That's right. I like that. It's right there in the verse, isn't it? Yeah. Well, in, in verse five also it says, "For it is sanctified by the word of God." So which ones did God sanctify? By I like it. Thank you, Charlene. Yeah, when we look at the context, the Bible really tells us what it's talking about, doesn't it? I really like what you guys brought up there. So sanctified by the word of God. We go back to the Old Testament, we see what God said it's okay to eat, and that's what it's talking about. So would you just, would you direct someone to Leviticus 11? I would, and Deuteronomy chapter 14, and Daniel chapter 1. I mean, I would help them understand that God does allow certain animals to be eaten today uh, if they're prepared in the right way, but ultimately... The best diet is the original diet he gave Adam and Eve. It's the one that Daniel chose in Daniel chapter 1. And it's the one that helps us be the healthiest. And science backs that up now. We can see that. Pastor, do you know of any other church or organization that forbids people to get married other than the Catholic Church? Not one that is of a global scale like that the Catholic Church is. So this kind of... <laughs> That's that's what, too. I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right about that. There's a lot of texts that point directly to the Catholic Church. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 17, uh, we're told that this entity that the Bible is talking about, because it doesn't say Catholic Church, it gives you the characteristics of it, and then you go you go and investigate and see it's talking about the Catholic Church. But it says that she's located on the city of Seven Hills. Mm -hmm. And we know Rome is known for the city of seven hills. So, I mean, we have enough uh, evidence from the Bible that we don't have five to choose from, right? We only really only point to one. So, so back in Daniel chapter one, we have the results of eating a plant-based diet. Um, they're able to receive the gifts from God that he wants to give us, knowledge, skill, and understanding. And verse 18, at the end of the days, that means uh, at the end of his time in the University of Babylon. So this has been about two years later, when the king, as Nebuchadnezzar, had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, in verse 19, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. So he recognized that, wow, I mean, these young Hebrew kids, 
I mean, they're 20, 21 years old now, right? And they're like, he's like, wow, they, they, they really outshine the other people. Pastor, the others must have all been Jewish too. You, well, I think they took... They took them from other countries, they did. it sounds like. I, there were some other Jewish youth there as well. Mm -hmm. I can't deny that. But I do think there were other countries there as well too. But you can see, just because you were the literal descendant of Abraham didn't mean you, you followed the scriptures. Right. Right? right? It's the same with us. Just because you're a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't necessarily mean that you're following the scriptures, right? right. A membership doesn't uh, dictate that, yeah, you're ready for heaven. It, it is definitely a good step. But I think what we have to have is reading the Bible every day, allowing God to be changing us into his likeness, walking with Christ, spending time in prayer, communing with God, this, to me, is really uh, the difference between a professed Christian and a person that is walking by faith, right? You can be a professed Christian, but doing, it doesn't do any good. Just a professed Christian. A lot of people say they're Christians, but they don't attend church, they don't read the Bible, <clears throat> they're not really interested in spiritual things. It's a choice. Yeah. So, <clears throat> it says they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. So, the popular culture at that time in Babylon was, if you're an astrologer or a magician, you know, you've gone through the school of astrology, and you've gone through the university that the magicians went through, you were the most intelligent people in the kingdom, right? You you were in a position to where you could advise the king. But here the king sees that Daniel and his three friends were much uh, clearer in thinking and wisdom and understanding than the people who went through the popular culture and getting their degrees in the University of Astrology or, or uh, <coughs> magicians. I think... People notice the difference when you spend time with the Word of God. People notice the difference when you read the Word of God and apply it in your lives. When you when you digest it, when you allow it to become a part of you, when you're taking it in and you want to have your life in harmony with the Scriptures. Didn't the disciples, whenever uh, they were interviewed by the religious elite of their day, didn't the religious elite notice? Where did they get this knowledge? Where did they get this knowledge? They, they acknowledge that, hey, these guys have been with Jesus. It's, it's amazing the difference it makes in your life. Pastor Daniel is writing this, and Daniel says, 10 times smarter. Yeah. I mean, they must have really been far out. Yeah. So I think we see having our lives in harmony with the Word of God, there is, of course, spiritual benefits, absolutely. But there's benefits that you can read even now in this evil world that we live in. Right? Ten times. You know, Daniel wrote this at the end of his life. But he says there in verse 21, thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Osiris. And so, and that was around, you know, this is 70 years later. So Daniel was, now at this point in time, he's 20 or 21. 70 years later, he's in his 90s. So he's writing this when he was in his 90s. How old was Abraham when he died? 120. No, he was 120 when Sarah died. Right. One thing. Hundred and seventy-five. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Anybody, uh, you know Mark Elinich? Uh, I don't know if some of you know Mark. How old, Tim? How old is Mark's grandfather? He's 108 now. Wow. Yeah. When did he stop driving, or is he still driving? No, he, he stopped now, but it's just been a couple years ago. So he was 105 and still driving. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's yeah. wow. On the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> oh. He was driving up in the 
You had to go to Dunkin' Donuts. Wow. Wow. He wasn't the health message, though. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a strong Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, good genetics there. It does help, doesn't it? Oh, so we have this story, Daniel chapter 1, as kind of the introduction to the book of Daniel. And we learned quite a bit about the history behind this, the context, what's going on. We're, we're 600 uh, BC. This is the time frame that we're at. We see truths uh, from then that's still applicable to today. Uh, what I like is in verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And I think we should have the same attitude to Daniel because he lived a very productive life and was able to... Uh, well, I mean, he's impacting people all across the world today, isn't he? All right. Our lives are a ripple in a pond. I mean, we're not just uh, all by ourselves. The things that we do impact other people, right, right? Yeah. So, Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to jump into Daniel chapter 2 and kind of start that. We're only going to have, have about five minutes, but... Anything else from Daniel 1 that we want to uh, discuss, look at, questions before we go to Daniel 2? That time period that uh, he came before the king, or they did, was three years. It says that in verse 5. Yeah, it says they were supposed to be in the University of Babylon for three years of training. Right. So... They're, they're pretty young, 20, 21, maybe 22. So notice in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says we're in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. So what year did he start reigning? 603. Yeah, 605 B.C., right? So we're around 603 B.C., right? We're in that time frame. Around 603 B.C. is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And at this point in time, Daniel has not been elevated to the status of a wise, of one of the wise men yet. He's what I would call a junior wise man, right? right? He's like a, an apprentice, if you want to say that. It says in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And uh, what happens when you don't go without, when you go without sleep, you don't get no sleep? You get cranky. You get cranky. Yeah, you get real cranky, don't you? Yeah. You know, and I, and I wonder how, how many nights this took place. I can imagine how he was really on the edge. Verse 2 says, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So Daniel's not part of this group, okay? He's not in this group yet. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans <clears throat> spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. What's interesting about this, Chaldean is another term that we can say is synonymous with, with the Babylonian, Okay. So when you see land of Shinar, Chaldeans, uh, Babylonians, you can connect those as part of the same people group, okay? And what's interesting is they spoke, spoke Aramaic here. And so Daniel is writing Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, all the way to this part where he says that then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. He is writing all that in Hebrew. And then you know what he does? He switches changes. languages. He changes languages. In there. So he changes to Aramaic. And he starts writing Daniel chapter 2 in Aramaic. Up to and 7. He, yeah, he writes Daniel chapter 3 in Aramaic. He writes Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5 and Daniel chapter 6 and Daniel chapter 7 in Aramaic. And then you know what he does? He goes back to Hebrew in Daniel chapter 8. Finishes out the book. Isn't that interesting? I thought never in Israel chapter 4. Well, that's true. He did write it. Uh, but, you know, maybe Daniel copied it down. I don't know. You know, but Daniel, he is the one. He is the initiator of that. That's true. All that is in Aramaic. 
This is pretty cool. Why is it important? I wonder if I have time to do this. What version of the Bible do you use? Okay, King James, New King James. Anybody else have some other ones? You do any other ones in here that you're using today? I mean, I know you have them on your phone, and you can you can pull up just about anything you want to pull up nowadays. The version? What? The NIV. NIV. Okay. Any other ones? Somebody say clear word. Okay. Living. We use the New American Standard Bible frequently. New American Standard Bible, all right. So what we're looking at is the Bible translation continuum up on the board. On the left side is the formal translation where they try to stay uh, consistent with the original language, right, and translate it into our language, okay? Uh, the, the one that's the probably the highest uh, grade level of reading is the New American Standard. Uh, but as you go toward the right, you get away from a formal translation. On the far right, you have a paraphrase, which is typically a single individual who is giving their thoughts about Bible passage, right? And they write it out as they think it's what it's, what it's trying to say. And it's good maybe for devotional purposes. On the left, you typically have a group of scholars who are looking at the original language and trying to translate it into our language today. In the middle, you have uh, what I think is a kind of a combination of a formal translation and a paraphrase. You kind of have them mixed together, and I think the NIV is probably in that group. Uh, I, I would probably put the New Living Translation here. You know, if you guys, any of you guys are using the New Living Translation. So, what is interesting about Daniel chapter 2 is, oh, well, first of all, look, you mentioned the NIV, and I'm not going to be able to go, I'm not going to be able to finish this thought about Daniel 2 verse 4, okay? Because I've, I've got a, um, we're looking at leaving for a funeral here at 1030, so. This, uh, this continuum here, uh, if you look at the NIV being in the middle, why do I put it there? Jeremy, can you give me some reasons why NIV is put in the middle? Well, there's several that um, are just omitted. Several verses that are omitted. Yeah. Did you know that? Many, not several, but many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are many verses that are, that are not found in the NIV. If you go to Matthew 17, verse 21... Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, Mark 7, 16, Mark 9, 44, Mark 9, 46, Mark 11, 26, and it goes on and on and on. All these verses are not in the NIV version. They're not there. And so we got to be careful. There's some things about the NIV. I've read it, from Gen I've read it all the way through Gen Genesis to Revelation, and it's, a, it's got a nice way of flowing, and it's very readable. But you miss a lot of verses there. So you got to be careful. Well, they did have a group of people that came together and translated it, right? In some areas, they translated it right. Some areas, they, I think, missed the boat. And one of the areas is Revelation 22 14. Is that Catholic? I think they had some Catholic uh, influenced people on that. But notice, uh, Janet, you. Revelation 22, 14. Mm -hmm. Blessed so, are they that do his commandments. Okay, blessed are they that do his commandments. What does the NIV say in Revelation 22, 14? Somebody have that? Just to give you a flavor. As a matter of fact, Steve, the NASB, do you have that in front of you? I can have it in about 30 seconds. Okay. 
Do you mind grabbing the NASB and reading the very first line of Revelation 22, 14? What, what do you have for NIV for Revelation 22, 14? Blessed well, are those who wash their robes that they have to hide the right to the tree of life and they go through the gates into the city. And what does yours say, Gina? Blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have the right to the tree of life, right? Okay, okay I have it now. What does NASB say? Blessed are those who wash their robes. See, it's just like the NIV. So what you notice is uh, these newer translations here, the NIV, the NASV, and all new translations that I, what I have found <coughs> miss the boat there. I mean, <laughs> they're essentially eliminating the Ten Commandments in that phrase and substituting wash their robes, right? There's another verse that's missing that, that I found strange, but it's Acts 8, um, 37, and it's with Philip, and it said, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, this was to the eunuch that he was talking to, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That phrase is what is missing. That's right. In the NIV, Acts 8, 37 is not found. Yep. Right. So you can see, you got to be careful about what you choose. What, what I use in our class is this one, because it's based on the same text as the King James is based on, and it's written in our modern modern language, because there's a lot of words in the King James that don't mean the same today as they did back in uh, the 18th we century. We use the New King James Version. Yeah, the New King James. Is there any text left out of the New King James? There's not any, there's not text left out of the New King James, Is but th it's not a perfect translation either. You know, there's not a perfect one. The King James, in place of Passover, they say Easter in the book of Acts. The New, I mean, the New, the King James, the New King James in Psalms 146, verse 4, they say your, uh, your plans perish and say your faults perish. So th there's not a perfect translation, but these come awfully, awfully close, you know, and you can look at these other translations and really get a good view of what the scripture is trying to say in these particular passages. So I want to jump back on the Bible and share something really cool about Daniel 2, 4 next time, okay? All right. So be sure next time, bring your family, bring your friends, and bring your enemies. And, and let's see, uh, people who make me doubt that the Bible is true and really from God, we're going to address that next time. This is pretty cool. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful information for the book of Daniel. We pray that you help us have this in our own lives. Help us implement it. Help us be in harmony with you and, and have a life similar to Daniel who was so connected to you that you gave him the wisdom and the skill and the understanding. And we need that here in, in, in these times that we live in. So we thank you for this privilege and opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Yes, Enjoyed it. Happy Sabbath. 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 Happy Sabbath.